Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. We're going to rejoice and be glad. Amen? Amen. Amen. Isn't it beautiful out there? It's like, it's like perfect weather. I love this. I want to welcome you all here to Shepherd of the Hills this morning. It is a beautiful day to be here. It is a beautiful day to be worship, and I am so glad you are all here today. I want to especially welcome if you are new or visiting. It is a blessing to have you here, and we hope you are blessed to, have, blessed to be here this morning. My name is Mike. I am the pastor here. If you are new or visiting, or if it's just been a while since you've been here, we have a communication card in the pew in front of you, and you can just fill out as much of that as you feel comfortable with, and we will keep you up to date. Speaking, uh, and you can just drop it in the offering basket on the way out. And uh, speaking of the offering basket, if you want to give an offering, a tithe, or support the ministry here, give out of what God has blessed you, you can just do that through the offering basket there. Or you can just text GIVE to that number there, and what you'll do is you'll get a secure giving link. It's secure, it's easy, it's a great way to do it. All right, I have only got two announcements this morning, but they're both very important and very interesting. In fact, they're too important to be left to me. So, Lucas, which way did you go? Okay, he faked me out. He was there just a moment ago. Come on up. Good morning. I can't go off the cuff, so I need my notes here. Uh, so Summer Choir is coming back, um, and we need singers. Uh, it's a chance uh, to get right to the heart of what choir is, which is just a group of people uh, singing praises for the Lord. Uh, so it's real stripped down, no robes, no rehearsals. We just come in on Sunday morning. Uh, the first opportunity will be June 5th, that's Pentecost Sunday, um, for the 8.30 service. So like years past, it'll take place uh, Sunday morning. We'll meet at 7.45 in the music room. Um, no experience necessary. In fact, beginners are especially encouraged as a way to try it out. Um, participants can expect a light and relaxed experience, I promise. Uh, a great opportunity to fellowship with others, uh, to learn a simple piece of music, and most importantly, experience the joy of worship. And Izzy, come on up. Good morning. I'm Izzy Werner, and I will be attending the high school mission trip this summer. I would like to invite you to invest in our students who are participating in the mission trip to Kansas City, Missouri in June. Today you can purchase stock shares for $20 each. Your share includes an invitation to, get to a gathering for you to meet the students after our trip and learn how God worked through them on the mission trip. This year's mission trip involves serving in a diverse community, connecting with neighboring people by helping them complete projects and worshiping with students who are also serving in the Kansas City area. Stop by our table in the lobby after worship if you would like to invest in our students' mission trip. Thank you. Just a couple of things I want to tag on to each of those. First of all, on the mission trip front, we're very much talking about this as investing in this and investing in the future and investing in these kids. This isn't a fundraiser where you spend 20 bucks and they'll give you something that you don't really need anyway. This is about investing in the, let's be honest, I hate fundraisers, okay? <laughs> Let me just say that. But this is about investing in the kingdom of God and investing in their future. And I'm so excited that we're able to do this. And I'm so looking forward to that. And then to circle back to what Lucas was saying about summer choir, I just want to really give you an invitation to be part of that. And I want to say I am so excited about all the stuff that's going to go on Pentecost. June 5th, I know you all got a lot of graduations and going up to the cabin and everything else. But if you're in town... You want to be here on June 5th. That's all the announcement. No, I'm sorry. I have one more announcement. Today is High School Senior Sunday, and we're going to be... <laughs> we're all putting our best foot forward this morning, aren't we? Okay. Uh, this morning, we will be uh, blessing our high school seniors at the 1030 service, and it's very exciting. We're going to celebrate that, hear from a couple of them, bring them forward to pray for them. But we want to share with you what it's the, our high school seniors and a little bit about them. So we have a short video with all of our high school seniors and their uh, Bible verses. So go ahead and roll that. <laughs>
Just to say, it is an awesome bunch of high school students, and I want to thank everybody who is involved with the high school ministry and the junior high ministry and the Sunday school ministry and all those different ministries that helped mentor and shape those youth. It was awesome. So thank you for all you you have done. And I just got the great question of, can we, oh, sorry, sorry you're over there, there, Crystal. Can we use that text to give number for supporting the youth stock sale? Yes, you certainly can. Uh, we'll have the number up again after the service, and when you get the link, just when it asks, where do you want to contribute to, just click it for youth stock sale. So that is all the announcements we have this morning. So if you would please rise. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Also with you. Let's remain standing for our first song. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what 
we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. God, who was rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. God of the unknown, your mysteries are astounding. Give us knowledge where you see fit, and let us sit comfortably with that which we can never understand. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. At this point, we're going to dismiss the kids for Children's Church. So if you've got somebody who needs a little more of an active sermon between the ages of four and eight, you can just head out right through the back there, and we will bring them back after the sermon. And Jerry's going to come up for a reading this morning. morning. Today's reading is from Acts chapter 17, beginning with the 16th verse. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, What is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, He seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I am going to proclaim to you. 
The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Jerry, I was having one of those fish don't know their wet moments this week. You know how it is when somebody points out to you something you just should have been obvious to you? See, back in a previous congregation I had been a part of, we had made up sermon bingo cards while we were on staff. And it was everybody's idiosyncrasies who was part of the preaching rotation. So, for instance, if somebody mentioned the finest university in all of North Dakota, you just check off that box. And so it was everybody's little things, you know, if I was talking about the Vikings or somebody else was talking about working in Boston or growing up in Detroit, you would just check off that box. And it was a fun gag for those of us on staff. We never put it out to the congregation. But a friend of mine had texted me this and reminded me of it. So we all had a good laugh in our house. And then, of course, as soon as we get done laughing about it, Lorianne and the boys start to make up a list of all the things that I do here on a regular basis. Of course, the first thing being trolling the Packers fans. If you didn't want me to do it, you wouldn't make it so much fun, okay? But then they went off and listed three or four other things. And I'm like, yeah, okay, that's fair, that's fair, that's fair. And then I looked at the last one, I'm like, are you sure? Really? And we had this conversation of if I have this particular quirk. And I don't think so. They think I do. We're going to have to go to the tape and find out. But I tell you that because it puts an interesting spin on this lesson that Jerry just read for us. You see, this story is one of my favorites. And you've probably heard me talk about it before. We've been talking about Paul for the last few weeks about how he's traveling around all the Mediterranean basin and telling people about Jesus and starting new churches. And here he is in in Athens. And he starts talking to people in the synagogues and the markets. And eventually people bring him to this place called Mars Hill. Now the translation Jerry had there rendered that as, I can't even say the word, but it's the same thing. It just means Mars Hill in Greek, and some translations, depending on what you've got, it will either leave it as the Greek term or translate it to Mars Hill. And the reason it's called Mars Hill is because it's this hill where they had a temple to the Roman god of war called Mars. And on this hill, they had all these different things where there's these different altars, and you could make sacrifices to different gods, depending on what happened. Now, the Greeks did something very smart if you're a polytheist. You see, the way that system worked, the way the belief system worked, is if something good happened to you, you needed to go thank whichever God did that good thing for you. So if you came home from the war, you went to the Temple of Mars and you made a sacrifice and said, thank you, God, for keeping me safe. If your ship, your merchant ship came in, you went over to Poseidon's altar and you made a sacrifice and you said, thank you, Mr. Poseidon, for keeping us safe. Now, What happened if something good happened and you didn't know which God was responsible? This is a quandary, because in the Greek system, these gods are rather petty and spiteful. And so what they did is they had this altar to an unknown God. 
And so you would go and you would make a sacrifice and you would say, I don't know which God did me this favor, but I want to say thank you. And you would make a sacrifice. And it was good for you, it was good for the God, it was good for everybody except the animal that got sacrificed. Now, Paul is there. And he sees this altar to an unknown God. And he says, let me tell you about this unknown God. And he reaches out to the Greeks, and he quotes their own poets and their own philosophers. And he says, look, your own poet said, maybe we are even his offspring. And he says, in, the, in your poetry, you talk about how we live and we move and we have our be being in him. You guys have got a piece of the truth. And he uses that to jump off to telling people about Jesus and telling people about the God of Abraham and Isaac and Joseph, the God who made everything, the God who created the universe and then sent his son to die for our sins. Now let me just take a second and give you the traditional sermon that you often hear on this passage. I want to take the traditional sermon and then I want to twist it 90 degrees. The traditional sermon that you hear on this is what we need to do is make sure that we are reaching out to different people in our community and that we're reaching them where they're at and we're speaking their language and we're using their own cultural context and their own pieces to point to who Jesus is. And that's a great message. I love that message. If you're at a different church and you're hearing that message and you're thinking, this sounds familiar, enjoy that message. It's a message I have preached a lot of times. It is a message I have heard preached a lot of times because it is a message that we always need to be reminded of. And I have served in context, particularly when I was doing my internship in Seattle or I was starting out in ministry in, in Toledo, in places where the neighborhoods were changing and there was a lot of ethnic diversity and things were changing over and those congregations really struggled to reach out. And they struggled to see that these people needed to hear about Jesus, or maybe they knew they needed Jesus, but to make that leap to actually be able to make a contact, to be able to work, was hard. But sometimes we can do this. Sometimes we can reach out and we can talk about how we have these places in common. My congregation in Toledo developed this wonderful relationship with the elementary school next door. And I got to tell you, just ethnically, the kids in the elementary school next door looked nothing like the people of our congregation. But they said, you know what? Your kids are important to you. And our congregation said, kids are important to us. And even though we might have all these other differences, we want to bless you and love you. And so we ended up doing a lot of things to work in that neighborhood of giving away school supplies at the beginning of each year because there was a lot of kids in that neighborhood that could not afford pencils and paper and backpacks. And that congregation got to tutor kids over in that elementary school. And it was a really neat way of reaching out and recognizing this matters to you. Let's work together on these things. And then using that to point to who Jesus was. Because we could say, look, you matter to God, therefore you matter to us. And let us tell you about this Jesus. And it was such a neat experience. And I so, it's, a, it's been like 16 years since I've been there. And I still think fondly of that congregation. But let's twist this 90 degrees and play with this in a different way. You see, I don't think that's our biggest issue here. And I don't know whether we're talking here at Shepherd of the Hills or in Washington County. I think one of the things that we really struggle with is talking generation to generation. And partly this has been on my mind because it's high school senior Sunday, and part of it just because it's on my mind from the church health stuff we did, and part of it is just always on my mind. Because often what we do 
is we get in this mode where we think we're in our generation and we don't think about those other age groups. One of my formative experiences was I came of age at the height of baby boomer nostalgia. I came of age in this time when I cannot tell you how many times I heard a pastor start out a sermon with those words, do you remember where you were when you heard JFK was shot? Now some of you immediately flash back to that. And some of us are like, no, I wasn't born yet. Okay? But I came of age with this time when we always heard that, when Forrest Gump was everywhere. And there were, yeah, exactly. I refused to see Forrest Gump just out of spite. Okay? I asked some of the high schoolers the other day, have you seen Forrest Gump? And a surprising number had. But it was one of those things where it was everywhere. And again, it was that fish don't know they're wet. Because none of those pastors thought to themselves, gosh, I bet there's a chunk of this congregation that has never, was never around them. It just didn't cross their mind. And so often we get in that silo where we think where we're at is where everybody's at. And it's easy to be in that context where we have friends and we have colleagues who are all of a similar age bracket. And we have our own language and our own shorthand. And we don't realize there's others. In my last congregation, there was a number of baby boomers on staff and they would get off on these odd tangents, and because we had somebody who had the same name as somebody who had been on Monty Hall's Let's Make a Deal, and they would start talking about this. And I'd be sitting there looking at myself and somebody else who was my age and a couple of our younger staff members. I'd be like, do you guys know what they're talking about? No. And then the younger folks would start talking about something they'd seen and on some social media, and I'd just be like, ah, I got nothing. I just got nothing. So let's approach this two ways. Let's approach this both inside the church and outside the church. You see, inside the church, I want to tell you this. We need each other. We absolutely need each other. Every generation needs every other generation. Let me tell you this. When I started out in ministry, we had a coach, and we were working down in Texas, and we had this guy who had been in ministry for forever, and he was awesome, and his name was Bob, and he had this thick Oklahoma accent, and he had planted eight different churches, and then he went into coaching. And so I would call him up, and I would say, Bob, I got this great idea. I want to do this, and I, I, I'm not even going to try and imitate his accent. But he would say, Mike, that's great. I'm so excited for you. Have you thought about this? I'm like, well, no, I haven't. He'd say, well, what about this? Have you thought about how that's going to impact your schedule for this? I'm like, oh. He's like, well, what about your space needs? And what are you going to do for nursery? I'm like, oh. And I'd spend like a half an hour on the phone with him. And he'd just ask me some very nice questions. And I'd be like, you're right, Bob. That was a stupid idea. I'm not going to do it. <laughs> he'd never even say it that way. But he would just be asking me questions. I'm like, He's so smart. We still have the notes from some of the coaching sessions. The guy was just brilliant. But I so valued his experience because he had been there and he had done that and he loved it and he was able to share with us just all this stuff. And whenever we asked him a question, he never talked down to us. I always treated us with respect, but it's just that here's who you are. And this is the model that we get when Paul is writing to Timothy. In the book of Timothy, you get this whole thing of Paul saying to Timothy, look, you are receiving this faith that has been passed down from your mother and your grandmother and all these elders who's gone before you. And he's saying, this is what you get. And you're inheriting this tradition. And love it and cherish it and take that wisdom that these people have earned through painful experience. Let's flip it around the other way. In that same letter, Paul says to Timothy, don't let anybody look down at you because you're young. Now, often we just truncate it to don't let anybody look down at you because you're young. But the full verse is so much more interesting. Paul says, don't let anybody look down at you because you're young. 
but set an example in faith and love and charity. And Paul goes on to talk about, look, you've got all this energy, you've got this excitement, you've got all this stuff, go do this ministry and set it. So these elders look at you and they say, we are proud to see what he's done and see how God has used him. We're having high school senior Sunday. We're blessing the high schoolers and we're so excited to see where God is taking them next. But I want to share an interesting observation for you. Youth guy I used to work with made this point. He said every church he had ever been a part of, and I, as he thought about it, I racked my brain. I'm like, yeah, that's, that's true for me too. Every church I've ever been a part of, the youth were the first ones to do mission trips. My home church, the church I grew up at, which later in, in later decades sent out mobs, literal hundred-person mission trips to places like Jamaica. Started out with a bunch of us high schoolers going on an old school bus with no air conditioning. And we'd go to places like Colorado or Florida and build houses for Habitat for Humanity. It was so much fun. And it set the example for the congregation. Because those adults looked at that like, you know, we could do that. And they did. Now, let's go back to the very beginning, the first line of what Jerry read. Jerry said, Paul, or Jerry was reading the passage from Acts, and it says there that Paul was distressed when he sees all the idols. Distressed. And I find that such an interesting word. Because Paul is upset about seeing all these idols, seeing all these things, these places where people are worshiping foreign gods, and it just bugs him at a, just a gut level. And i got to admit, I understand this. It makes sense to me. But I want to flip this into our context here. We're talking about people outside of the church. So often what we do is we look around at people and we say, you're from this generation, you're from this group, and I don't like you because of it. And it might be some cultural marker. It might be whatever nostalgia. It might be whatever new trend. It might be whatever this. And I have had so many of these conversations on both ways from people who say, do you know what these kids are doing? Or do you know what these millennials are doing? Or do you know what these folks are doing? And they want to write them off. And flip side is, do you know what these old folks, they don't want to do anything new. They still want it to be whatever year it was that they think are the golden days. I've heard that conversation in so many ways, and it drives me crazy. And what we want to do is we want to reach out to people and look beyond the cultural markers. Look beyond those pieces that we say just want to make us write them off. Friends, we have so much to offer this world. And one of the things that I have come to appreciate from this point in my life is just the parallels between these generations the parallels between different ways that we experience things. I read this really interesting piece a few months ago, and it was talking about the difference between young voters and old voters. It was written strictly as a secular thing, strictly as a political thing. It was not talking about church at all. But it was a fascinating piece, and it tells us an interesting truth. When they asked older voters and younger voters what their biggest issues were in the election... You know what they said? Same thing. It was crime, it was inflation. At the time, it was still in the middle of COVID, so COVID. It was all those things. And now you could say that maybe one of them approached things differently than the other. But looking at the core of society, they all said, yeah, these are the things that we need to grapple with. It was really interesting for me. I was just thinking about this. My mom's mom. Growing up on the farm, up in northern North Dakota, 
six miles from the Canadian border. And they lived through the Depression. And they still had some of those habits from the Depression. I was hanging on to stuff. I mean, the house was immaculate. It was, they were not hoarders or anything, but they were frugal and used every part of the dollar. And it's interesting to see just how some of those habits are popping back up for younger folks, having lived through the Great Recession, living through all this inflation stuff. There is a wonderful way that we can connect with people of every generation out there and say, you know, we've learned from these things. Let us help you. Those bigger questions that you're wrestling with. How do we live in this world? How do we deal with this ever-changing world? It all comes back to this unknown God, which is proclaimed to us. And I want to encourage you to look beyond whatever cultural markers, whatever pieces that you're dealing with, whatever parts that drive you crazy, and say, you know what? These people I'm talking to, they were made in the image of God. And Jesus died for them and their sins just as much as he died for mine. Because that is the core of what Paul was preaching and the truth that we all need to live. Amen. Let's stand and we'll sing. Let us together celebrate our common faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the Church people in need, and all of creation. Loving God, lead us to follow your spirit rather than our own prejudices or desires as the church cares for one another. 
Open us to perceive your gifts in those we least expect. Lord, in your mercy. Humble the rulers of nations before your splendor. Direct them to the people who need their attention most and turn them from the temptation to hoard wealth and abuse power. Lord, in your mercy. Hasten to dwell among those who are in pain, ill, or distress. Especially we pray for Don Slichter, for Thanksgiving, and for good test results. As Christ enters our deepest suffering, remain with those experienced despair and great need. Lord, in your mercy. Place holy love at the center of all our relationships and communities. By your love, heal us, convict us, and renew us. Bring an end to racism in our churches and communities. Let everyone know your goodness by the love we show one another. Lord, in your mercy. Together, let us pray for St. Gabriel Catholic Church in Hubertus. We pray that God would bless them and pour out the Holy Spirit on the community. Lord, in your mercy. Give us a place in the diverse company of your beloved saints. Teach us the value of each person's identity and bless us with a shared identity as your children, kindred of Christ. Lord, in your mercy. In your mercy, O God, respond to these prayers and renew us by your life-giving spirit through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The Lord be with you. you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed our right, our duty, and our joy that we should all times and all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, for the glorious resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ, the true Paschal Lamb who gave himself to take away our sin, who in dying has destroyed death, and who in rising has brought us to new eternal life. And so, with Mary Magdalene and Peter and all the witnesses of the resurrection, with earth and sea and all their creatures, with angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took the bread, gave thanks, and broke it. Gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all the drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. So together, we pray the prayer he taught us. Our Father... Who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. It's not a temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The table is now ready. We believe that all those who believe that Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior are welcome. The ushers will direct you up the center aisle and back down the side aisle. Children who have not yet received communion instruction are more than welcome to come forward for a blessing. And if the usher, excuse me, if the communion assistants please step over here, we'll commune you first and go ahead and be seated. The ushers will direct you forward when we're ready.
If you'd please rise. We don't take communion as a collection of individuals, but we take communion knit together in what Jesus has done for us. And so receive this blessing. May this heavenly food, the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, strengthen you and keep you in his grace until he comes again. Amen. Now, where worship does not end, but it does change form, and as we go into this world, we worship with our words, our actions, our relationships, until we come back together and worship together as a body. And so as you go, take this benediction with you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. May he look upon you with favor and grant you his peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please remain standing for our closing song.